You're listening to the LA Football Podcast. Hey, Los Angeles, welcome back to the LA Football Show here on the LA Football Network, live on the Mightier 1090 ESPN Radio. This is going to be your UCLA Bruins segment of the show. Hope everyone's having a fantastic Friday, or if you're on podcast, whenever you're listening to this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, wherever you are, thank you for tuning in joining me as always the madman jamal madney my man it's uh spring ball spring is in the air not only in the weather today was beautiful thursday was beautiful friday's been beautiful uh thursday i went and sat outside to work all day i just went in old town pasadena grabbed a little table downtown and had my laptop and enjoyed some sunshine so the spring is finally here the weather and also for football, spring is here. And UCLA, we talked about it last time, or last episode on our live show, just kind of got things rolling. Um, but it's been cool this year, Jamal, because they they haven't opened to the public, which I don't think they've ever done before. UCLA uh, showing some, you know, allowing people in inside a little bit to see what's going on with the football team. What's been your just initial thoughts so far of, you know, just a couple days of, of spring game or spring ball? Yeah, no, it's the Bruins allowing folks into the, uh, the inner sanctum, if you will. And so a little bit of a culture shift here with Chip. You have to believe that has something to do with Martin Jarman and Ken Norton Jr. And even DeAnton Lynn being more, you know, energetic and, and media friendly to allow you know, folks to kind of come in, you know, it's been a really interesting first couple of days of spring practice. I know we've got Will Decker out there and, and some other folks that we know very well. And I think the big takeaways for me, Ryan, are it's been very interesting in how Chip has run his practices where there isn't really a traditional number one unit, number two unit and so forth. Quarterbacks are rotating with different guys Different positional groups are getting mixed and interspersed with each other. So there's really kind of an interspersing that's going on, which is really creating kind of a democracy and an equitable environment here where Chip is really treating this as a competition. A guy like Justin Martin's going with number one receiver sometimes. Dante Moore's going with number three receivers. Garbers, uh, Schley, they're all sort of getting in on the act. I think the second big takeaway for me is the quality of quarterback play is very high. Yeah. Dante Moore is every bit as advertised. He's been slinging it around. I think day one, he was maybe the most accurate guy. And then day two, I think Garbers and Shali have also really shown a lot in terms of just velocity, being able to make all the throws. And I think we have a real battle on our hands here and the makings of a great quarterback competition and a compelling one going deep into spring ball and into that spring game, I think is something that we have on our hands. And I think the third element for me is J. Michael Sturdivant and Kyle mm -hmm. Ford are starting to separate. And J. Michael Sturdivant, notably on day two, made about a half a dozen catches, both in kind of seven on seven shorts situations, as well as 11 on 11. Kyle Ford made some big plays out there. And, and you're starting to see some separation with those two guys. Now, how that plays out with the incumbents, with the likes of a TMA and Cam Brown and others, I think remains to be seen. But I think those two guys are making a legitimate case that even from day one, day two onwards, that could be option one, option two from a passing game standpoint moving forward. So those are kind of the three big takeaways. I think a lot of depth all over the field. I think we've seen a couple of moments with the secondary Obviously, the Kirk was the Davies. Kamari Ramsey, the redshirt freshman that UCLA was able to pluck from Stanford, is making some noise a little bit. And I think the backs are also, you know, it's just as fierce a competition in the in the running back room as it is with the quarterbacks with the likes of Harden and Atkins. And Colson Yankoff looks a little slimmer, a little leaner. And so he's he's looking like a guy who maybe was on that TB12 diet over the summer because he's looking kind of lean and mean as well and say, hey, don't forget about me. I'm very much a factor here. So lots to be excited about here, Ryan. I think, I don't know if it's the combination of folks being accessible in terms of the practices being open to the public or the depth of talent all over the place or the mystery around who's going to start in different positions 
or maybe it's just a little bit of all of the above. But I think all of those ingredients have kind of given a different energy to UCLA here in the spring than in years past. Yeah, because, you know, to start, I mean, like I said, these have never been open. And even last year when they did, they didn't do a traditional spring game either. It was like the spring showcase, which I believe you were at. It's yep. a glorified practice, which was only one event for these fans to go to. So it's kind of like everyone doesn't even think of UCLA football until fall arrives, whereas USC across town is they, I mean, it's not necessarily public uh, practices, but they've notarized their practices. They have media at their practices. I've been at many of them and then they do their big spring game you know, at the Coliseum, uh, which last year I think was record high, 33,000 people or so at it. So it's good to see UCLA now inviting fans to come, get people excited now in, I guess we're in April now, in April as opposed to August. And because there is a lot to be excited about. And, you know, we are at a time in this Chip Kelly era where coming off his best season. And I know there was still some let down there, but there's a lot to be, if you're a positive outlook optimist. There's a lot, a lot, a lot to be excited about with this program, and with this team. And it starts with those four quarterbacks that you mentioned. And I am very pleased and I'm not at all surprised because of how chip runs things traditionally or how I should say good coaches run things traditionally, but I'm very pleased that it is just guys rotating, getting used to different ones, not having a head start, like not saying Dante, you're going to go with the ones until you lose it kind of thing. It's just, Hey, let's, get everyone acclimated because it's spring. I mean, you need to see everyone with everyone before you can really start pinpointing who's where. Now, if we were doing this two weeks before, you know, games are starting, then I'd maybe be a little concerned, but in the spring, this is the way it should be. And, you know, I, I'm excited to see even a guy like Justin Martin that everyone, including myself has, I wouldn't say forgotten about, but is not really talking about just because of the depth of talent with the other three. And, you know, he was a highly recruited guy from right here in Los Angeles maybe a little overblown at first because of just the one thirteen touchdown game. Um, but still a big body guy being a freshman last year, a uh, lot of athleticism there. So, I mean, I'm not saying he's actually going to win the job, but I mean, it's just crazy. And we've talked about it before, how deep this quarterback room, I, I think by far the deepest QB room in college football, uh, or at least in the pac 12 for sure. And, and USC is probably pretty close with the aforementioned Miller Moss and uh, Malachi Nelson. And obviously, Caleb being the best of, of really any of the seven. But when you just look at one through four uh, at UCLA, I mean, it's a lot to be excited about. And let me ask you this before I kind of talk, touch on your other points. Um, we both have said we, we believe Dante Moore will be the starter. Uh, just he's that much. His talent is that much higher. And just what he's shown at so quickly already. Let's say he's not. Let's say it's Schley or Garbers or even a Justin Martin beats him out for, for whatever reason. I'll give my answer after. Would that concern you at all? Or would you say, you know what? This is fine. There's still plenty of time to develop. Or would that kind of, okay, hold on. He didn't win it as a freshman. Maybe he's not as good as we thought. No, I, it wouldn't concern me at all. And I think that it would speak to just how prepared Garbers and Schley are. And we got we to gotta remember that these guys are one, two, three years older in some cases than Dante Moore. They're, they're physically more developed. And you, no amount of practice is, is going to sort of overcome human biology in some cases. So wouldn't concern me at all. I think what's fascinating for me, Ryan, and hopefully is the case for a lot of Bruin fans, this is the first time we're sort of getting into the psyche of Chip Kelly in terms of how he makes decisions about personnel, particularly at his most important positions. Because if you think about it, this is year six of the Kelly era. It's the first year he doesn't have DTR. It's the yep. first year it isn't obvious who his number one quarterback is going to be. Because even by about the second day of spring back in 2018, he knew it was going to be DTR because he was going up against Wilton Spate. No disrespect to Wilton Spate, but that was sort of a serviceable backup at the, at the college level with a very established sort of ceiling of what his abilities were. And so he was always predetermined in terms of knowing that it was going to be DTR. I think this year it's truly wide open in terms of who his quarterback is going to be. And also he's totally wide open at the running back position. Let's go back. I mean, whether it was Charbonnet, whether it was Joshua Kelly, whether it was Dimitri Felton, I mean, the last three or four years, there's been a very clear pecking order who the number one running back was going to be coming in. And all of our questions were always, well, who's going to be the number two quarterback, the number two running back 
to sort of alleviate the carries and have that two back system. This is the first time that in, in the Chip Kelly era, the two most important positions for his system, quarterback and running back, are truly wide open. So we get an insight. We get sort of a level of intimacy into how Chip Kelly organizes practices, what he's looking for, how he's going to synthesize information, and then what is he going to ultimately use to make his decisions and repeat that decision-making process moving forward. And so I think it's a fascinating time right now to go to spring practice and look at that because I think it's a view of Chip Kelly that we haven't had in the last six years. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great point. And, and just to go back to the beginning, yeah, I agree. I would not concern me at all if um, someone does beat out Dante Moore, just because, you know, of how young he is, how, how much life he has in college. And I think that would just, it would more so tell you how well and deserved the other quarter, whoever, whatever quarterback wins it outright is. Um, now, if it was year two or three and Dante Moore still is not winning, then that's a different conversation. But this early on now, I still think he will. But yeah, it would not be concerning. Um, let me ask you this. So you mentioned J. Michael Sturdivant, who early on already has impressed very well. Obviously, we know what, how well he was at Cal, and it was a big-time transfer to come over here. You mentioned Kyle Ford, too, which is great. Um, but Sturdivant's been impressive. You know, our, our buddy Will Decker has kind of gushed about him since he got here, and then being able to see him up close in person has really showed out. When you look at the top two receiver transfers in the Pac-12, you – I, I – one A, one B, whatever you want to call it. J. Michael Sturdivant from Cal to UCLA, Dorian Singer from Arizona to USC. Which one in your opinion? I know this is the Bruins segment, the Bruins show, but you can decide for yourself. Which one do you think will have the bigger impact next year? So it's a it's a great question. It's a loaded question because I think that Sturdivant has clearly separated. I think for UCLA, I think it's going to be Sturdivant because. Kelly, for the first time, is going to have a vertical threat at receiver that's more of an every down wide receiver. I think Kaz Allen was that, but just given Kaz Allen's frame, I think Chip held back a little bit and knew that Kaz Allen was kind of on a pitch count in many ways just because his frame was, was so small and he was a little fragile. And we saw elements of that in that Arizona State game where he got popped and he fumbled and, and so forth. And we also saw the greatest elements with Kaz Allen in, in that USC game from two years ago. To me, Sturdivant, I think, has separated from the pack and will continue to do so and gives Chip Kelly an element that he just hasn't seen in, in Westwood. And I think the combination of that, regardless of who the quarterback is going to be, Sturdivant is going to be that number one, number one A type of receiver. I think with Singer, he's going to go in as the number one guy no question about it, but I think it's going to be more of a function of everyone else around him. You know, you, you still have to deal with Todd Washington, who's who's been so well in this system. You still, Brendan Rice broke out in such a significant way in the Cotton Bowl. You got these two youngins in Zakaria Branch and Makai Lemon. So I think Singer has a less of a leash, a less of an interval to sort of make a big opportunity, whereas Sturdivant can kind of grow into his role as wide receiver number one, because there really isn't anyone going to be chasing him. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I think both are going to be, both are such big time transfers. Um, and ironically, staying within the Pac-12 and then going to the two rival schools in LA. I think agreeing with you and basically with everything you said, you know, Sturdivant will just be so much more vital, I think, for the success of the UCLA offense. And obviously, you know, it's run first and we know how great the four backs are that they're, they're all going to have what we talked about at nauseum. But I think the fact that it's going to be a first time starting QB, uh, or I guess, you know, uh, Schley started before he transferred, but truly if it's more or Garber's first time starting QB, Schley first time in the system. Uh, so you have that aspect of it. You have, and then you have, he is the clear number one receiver along the lights of Ford. And then after that, it's kind of, I wouldn't say a chasm, but a, a decent drop off. Whereas at SC, you have the reigning Heisman coming back and you have so much depth of talent around him that Singer's going to get his, I mean, that's a huge piece, a huge uh, boost to that offense that just lost Jordan Addison. But I mean, you have 
everyone you mentioned and Mario Williams and all these guys back at Deuce Robinson now as tight end. And, uh, they didn't even and so mention he, Mario Williams, like yeah. that's how deep they were. Like I forgot about Mario Williams when I was going through that list. That's how insane that USC receiving core is. And I think Ryan, what's interesting is it brings up an, a, a very fascinating point here. Are we talking statistics or are we talking value? Because I think there's a world where, Yep. Singer could still have greater statistics than Sturdivant just because of the guy who's throwing to him and how often and Lincoln and the system and the air raid and the whole deal. But who's going to be more valuable? And I think to me, I think statistics, it's going to be kind of a coin toss because yep. of how many other mouths there are going to be to feed on the USC side. But I think in terms of value, who's going to be the most valuable player to his respective team? I think it's going to be Sturdivant very significantly there because of the lack of depth, relatively speaking, in Westwood versus in downtown L.A. And so I think Sturdivant, even if he has 40 catches on the year for eight touchdowns and seven or 800 yards, those 40 catches are going to be massive catches and huge plays that kind of change the complexion of a drive, of a half, of a game. And I think when you look back, you're going to say, man, he was – so valuable and his statistics were even outsized potentially. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And it reminds me and obviously very different style of players but it reminds me of Jake Bobo last year, right? Like statistically Bobo didn't have an off the chart season, but the, the statistics that he did have were so valuable at such crucial moments. Um, and then this year in a very different way, you know, we'd said, we talked about how this, this running game is going to be even more vital just because of the youth and lack of experience at quarterback. You don't have a fifth year senior running this offense anymore. You have either a true freshman or a first time starter in this system regardless. And so they're going to lean on the run. And so they're not going to be thrown around as much. And they're most likely, I mean, who knows, maybe they'll surprise us all and Dante Moore throws for 4,500 yards and they're just throwing it all over the yard. But most likely statistically, as you just mentioned, it's not going to be this crazy, you know, 1200 yard receiving season with 12 touchdowns it could be six or 700 but those six or 700 are going to be so critical in each moment and maybe big third down conversions maybe they get one deep long ball a game because the guy can absolutely burn when needed and can can break away from coverage so um i agree as great as singer is going to be at sc and and statistically might even have a better year sturdivant is going to be so important and vital for this offense to truly reach that next level when and if I shouldn't say when I should say if the running game gets slowed down at all and they have to turn to the past, that's who they're going to rely on. And then obviously they'll sprinkle in some Kyle Ford as well. So um, I can't wait to watch it, man. I mean, I just remember when that transfer happened, uh, it was like, man, that's such a huge get for uh, the Bruins. You know, also they took their, their linebacker on the other side of the ball, right. Or a defenseman, a defensive player. And then they get Sturdivant as well. So coming back to the, the true California school down here in LA. No doubt, Ryan. And I think that there's just so much optimism right now in the air. It's just day two of spring ball. But, you know, it is going to be a first-time starter at the quarterback position. And we've talked about it. Schley started, but it's going to be a first-time D1 Power 5 starter. And so I think what's also going to be fascinating to me is, depending on how spring plays out, how many guys are going to transfer immediately after? Right. You know, once once that pecking order is established, I think at least one guy is going to transfer, maybe even two. But I think the over under, if I were Vegas, would be one and a half to say, hey, look, especially with some of these older guys. I mean, if you're a Garbers or you're a Schlee, uh, you know, you're like, well, I mean, I just don't have that much eligibility left. So I got to go make a move. If you're Martin, you're you're thinking, hey, I'm still young. Let me see what happens. You may be more inclined to stay. But if you're one of these older guys, I mean, you're definitely headed probably for the exits, especially if you're Garber. So I think it's going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out, who ends up being number one. I'm still completely 100 percent certain it'll be Dante Moore. And and here's the thing. Even if Dante Moore is not the most talented guy on the practice field, I think Dante Moore is still going to be the starting quarterback, because I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to build a run. And I think so many times coaches, because they don't have the leash, because they don't have the security from their AD, they don't have the security from their contract, they have to go about everything year over year. And sometimes that short-term thinking sacrifices the the long-term global optimum outcome. 
And I think in this particular case, because Chip has the faith of Martin Jarman, I think everyone wants to see Chip here long term. I think he can afford to say, you know what? Maybe a Garbers is a A plus and Dante was only an A or an A minus, but I need the A minus kid at 18 to get in there. So he becomes A plus plus for two years of his eligibility and gives us a real opportunity to win the conference, get into the CFP, play in big bowl games. And so that to me is if you're doing the long-term thinking, it has to be Dante Moore. Yeah. And I can't wait for two years watching Dante Moore play in front of his hometown at, at the big house in Michigan as the Bruins hopefully take down the Wolverines in 2024, which will be a blast. Uh, but anyway, that's all the time we got for Bruins Talk. Got another break on radio uh, for podcast. Everyone have a blessed weekend, and we'll talk to you all uh, next week. And radio will be back at the top of the hour for more L.A. Football Talk. This is the L.A. Football Show. Brian Jamal, talk to you all here in just a few. You're listening to the L.A. Football Podcast.